morning, everybody. I'm Lucy Bernholtz. I am a managing director with a firm called Arabella Advisors, having just sold to them my own consulting firm. It's my great pleasure to be joined by Craig Newmark and Perla Nee, two of the uh, pioneers in uh, changing how we think about what information matters as we try to make our worlds a better place. So the way we're going to work this is um, I'm going to just set the stage a little bit about what we're here to talk about. Perla will introduce Great Nonprofits, which is the organization she founded a few years ago. Craig will introduce Craig Connects, which is a new endeavor he's launched just this year. I'll try to get a conversation going, and then we're counting on you to do the heavy lifting. Uh, this is really an attempt to get a conversation going about how do we learn what works? How do we know what information matters? How do we access that information? How do we provide that information? I thought Amy Allison's comment this morning was right on the money for the theme of this day. She said that facts don't change the world, stories do. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not so sure I believe that wholeheartedly. I think there is a role for facts. I th certainly think there's a role for data, and I certainly think there's a role for stories. And in the two platforms that Perla and Craig have each, uh, are each involved with, I think uh, they also think there's a role for facts, data, information, and of course, stories. So that's what we'll be talking about. Pearl, I'm gonna ask you to um, introduce for us great nonprofits to the, tell us a little bit about the platform and what you're trying to do. Um, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here at the Craigslist Bootcamp. Um, we've had a long association with Craig, um, as well as, as the Craigslist uh, Foundation. Um, so I wanna tell you just a quick story about why great nonprofits was started. And it was started as a result of a personal failure of mine. Um, at the time, I was the publisher of a magazine called the Stanford Social Innovation Review, which focuses on management of nonprofits. And Hurricane Katrina hit. And like many of you, I struggled with trying to decide, who do I give money to? Do I give money to the Red Cross? Do I give money to some organizations I haven't heard of based in New Orleans? Um, my friends all said to me, well, you're the philanthropy expert. You know, <laughs> tell us who to give to. Uh, one of my friends um, ran a corporate philanthropy, and, uh, and he asked for my advice, and I said, I don't know, you know, Red Cross? And this is, you know, back when they were under different management, so I'm sure they're quite different today. But uh, he ended up matching his, his employees' donations to the Red Cross um, almost $200,000. And six months later, he called me up. And this was after uh, the Red Cross uh, was now in front of congressional investigators for mismanagement and misuse of the money. And um, apparently, during that six-month period, um, when uh, New Orleans victims were trying to get you know, water, trying to get hooked up to getting replacement IDs, finding housing and shelter, they were actually on Craigslist's uh, uh, Craig's uh, website talking about how the Red Cross was not answering the phones, how it was impossible to get any service. So my friend, you know, he's on this phone with me um, this six months later, and he said, Perla, I will never give money to the Red Cross again. That was such a horrible experience. And it dawned on me, wow, you know, I was not, I totally failed in this respect to suggest an alternative other than a name brand charity that we kind of all have heard about and have, you know, great advertising and great branding. Um, and so Great Nonprofits was uh, an attempt to create a more citizen action based knowledge um, where the information about nonprofits really comes from the community, the community of your donors, your volunteers, and the clients that you serve, um, the community of your partners, and sometimes your board members as well. Um, so I'm gonna show some just quick slides of the, uh, what we have, and uh, we were launched uh, right here in San Francisco Bay Area, so really proud to be a local member of this community. So how many guys are familiar with this? Any of these organizations? Yeah. And how often do you use these rating sites to make purchasing decisions or restaurant decisions? Frequently? Yeah. This is the birthplace of Yelp as well. So I'm not surprised. This, um, what we've seen is that online reviews have been phenomenally useful for consumers to make 
decisions in terms of their buying power. In terms of buying products, restaurants, hotels, one really interesting statistic is that um, hotels in Paris, which is the most competitive um, hotel market in the entire world, the top two hotels um, that are consistently overbooked are independent hotels which do no advertising. <laughs> and the reason why they're so popular is because they're ranked number one and number two on TripAdvisor. They're independent or hotels. And that is the kind of thing that we're seeing in the consumer field where consumers are really relying on these information about from other consumers, other people like them who've had an experience with a product or an experience with a service and who are saying, hey, you know, I, these are my candid experiences. This is not marketing PR written by the organization itself. And this is how, you know, I felt about it. And these sites are aggregating it through their, you know, wisdom of the crowds and presenting it to all of you who can help hopefully use these reviews to make better decisions. So we're taking that same model and applying it to nonprofits. So here's one example. This is um, of Goodwill here in San Francisco. Um, I don't know if you guys can all read that, so I'm going to read it to you. This is a review written by M. Solomon. He says he's a client served, and he works in the Goodwill's warehouse, and he's in their job training program. He says, when I rent, came to Goodwill in August 2007, I was on parole, homeless, and hardly involved with my two children. I was like a part-time father that wandered in and out of their lives. I did Goodwill's training program while working in the warehouse. Now my finances are in order, I'm off parole, and I can provide for my sons the right way. I can be a positive role model for them. Volunteers. We have a lot of stories from volunteers. This is a volunteer um, who is a member of the letter writing team for the Silver Star Families of America. This is an organization that serves veterans. And um, I'll just read it for you guys, those of you who can see it. I can barely see it myself. Um, he says, I joined the Silver Stars of America after my son, a US Marine, was wounded in Iraq. In addition to honoring and aiding those members of our military, they have provided me with moral support, friendship, and understanding. I've been honored to be able to help our troops in any small way I can, whether it's raising money for banners to present to them, sending cards and letters to those hospitalized, or just offering a kind word in support to their family. The Silver Star Families of America has made it possible. They're a great and loving bunch, and I'm proud to be one of them. Stories of donors. This one is from someone we recognize. Um, so this is a, a review of the Cambodian Children's Fund by Craig. Um, and Craig uh, has met Scott Neeson, the former uh, president of 20th Century Fox International, who traveled to Cambodia and um, started this project called Cambodian Children's Fund, which is really remarkable. There's um, lots of different reviews of it on our website, but basically uh, the donors uh, all consistently say the same thing. It's a, in a way for them to have um, a real connection to one of these children whose lives otherwise would be uh, confined to living in a municipal dump site in Cambodia. Um, and whose lives are now being transformed by uh, this, this organization which provides them with education in English and Khmer dance and computer training um, as well as vocational skills. We have a fantastic web, uh, badge that nonprofits could put on their own website and these are some sample badges that are on the websites to show off the reviews that they have. And the primary audience for this are potential supporters who come to your website, donors, to see that, wow, you know, you have a real badge showing that you know, people are talking about you and these are the things that they're saying. So some of you guys might have a Charity Navigator badge, which is great as well. Some of you guys might have the GuideStar badge, and this is an additional one that shows your credibility to your donors. We also do something uh, which is kind of unique in the content aggregation world of reviews, which you know, nonprofits, we, we love to think that we're um, in the center of the world, but unfortunately, we, it's, we're actually a very small sector con in compared to the consumer sector, where crowdsourcing of information is much easier because Amazon has so much traffic. So what we've done is we've created a platform where these reviews are collaboratively produced, collaboratively collected, and collaboratively syndicated. What that means is that we power reviews on other sites, and then the reviews are then shared by all the other sites. So for instance, this is um, GuideStar. This is a profile for the Center for Biological Diversity, and on the left are the reviews that we power with our technology. You can read the reviews, you can click on write a review, 
And then the review gets posted to GuideStar. They also get posted to great nonprofits, as well as some of the other partner sites. And uh, Charity Navigator is another one of our partner sites. So if you're listed on Charity Navigator, any reviews that you collect through great nonprofits or people write a review on GuideStar, they'll also show up on Charity Navigator, which is, I think, a really good complement for your profile because Charity Navigator um, you know, thus far before only had financial information. And as we know, that tells just a partial story of your organization's work. A lot of people say, you know, what if I get a negative review? Um, and so there's a couple things that we do. First of all, you can respond and comment to reviews. Uh, you can, we have an automatic filter for certain words. Um, let me show you just right there. There is a commenting feature that you could use to uh, respond to any of the reviews. And then lastly, I know this, you know, this notion of feedback is kind of new for the sector, um, is that you know, just take things with a grain of salt. It's just one subjective person's opinion. Uh, you know, when you look at Amazon, there's not any single product that never gets a negative review. None of us are perfect. And this is designed to be a way for us to show our human impa impact subjectively. Um, it's great that when it's combined with other kinds of data points, but this is sort of one, uh, one way to tell your story in a very human way. So I just wanted to also ask you guys, I mean, there, you guys are, have, many of you have been in the nonprofit sector for a while. Do you have at least one story from a client or a project that you tell to donors, supporters? Raise your hands. There you go. All right. Does everyone in your organization know that story? Fewer of you, right? Do you have board members or volunteers who can also tell a story about why they're involved with you? Show of hands, that's great. And have you asked them to share those stories? There you go, that's great, that's great. You know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Andy Goodman, as many of you guys know, and he's always about tell your story. Five times a day, you're telling your story as the executive director. Hopefully your volunteers are going out there and when they're you know, networking with other folks, they're telling your story. Your board member, when they're talking about what are the social causes they're involved in, they're telling your story. So you've got volunteers, you've got your clients, you've got your donors, and you've got other community partners who can tell, you, tell their story about you. We have this one nonprofit in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and um, they work a lot with the local government. And they actually have uh, one of the local government representatives who wrote a review about them. And he tells their story wherever he goes. Um, and that's been really helpful for them in terms of state funding, that they have this one local official who goes to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the, the capital, and tells their story to legislators. Um, so it's really easy to get reviews. Um, you can send an email out to people on your list of volunteers, your donors, your clients that you've served. You can Facebook it. We've seen a lot of organizations just post to Facebook, hey, you know, tell us a story about your experience with us. We've seen a lot of organizations tweet it out and say, tell us a story about you know, your experience with us. It's really simple. It's really easy to do. And then they would come to this page where they would write a review, and they would create a quick login. And that's about it. And we want you to encourage people to talk about these stories. I mean, I feel like, you know, in this age of, you know, Lady Gaga and the latest <laughs> Justin Bieber, you know, we're so surrounded by noise. And I think as nonprofits, we feel like, well, you know, I just have this small story. I can't compete with Lady Gaga. Um, so I'll just <laughs> leave you with guys with this one, um, one story. And it's, it's about this guy named Eric, Gon Eric uh, Gonzalez. And he... Um, this was in 2008, and he was diagnosed with a heart condition, and he did not have health insurance. His sister was an obscure blogger online, and she, um, she felt like she had to do something to raise money for his heart operation. So she tweeted out, my brother is very sick and dying, and we need to raise $600,000 for an operation. She just tweeted it out. One of the people who saw this message was a comedian from Brooklyn. His Twitter handle is The Expert. Um, and he's a stand-up comedian, and he is famous for his 60-second videos on YouTube. And he saw the tweet, and he thought, wow, you know, this looks like a worthy cause. I want to tell other people about it. So he retweeted it. And amongst his people who follow him was Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails. Trent Reznor saw this, and he's like, wow. 
this is really amazing. And he contacted uh, the woman who originally tweeted about her brother, and he told her that, you know, I want to do something. I want to raise money. I'll do a special backstage VIP pass for people, and that money will go towards your brother. And he was on tour that week. And that in one single week for these VIP backstage passes, he raised $675,000. $675,000. And so for all of you guys who, I know, you know, social media, it seems like a lot of work, posting these reviews, going on Twitter, going on Facebook. It's amazing when you do have a compelling story, the speed and focus with which it can rise to the top. So I encourage you guys all to take a look at great nonprofits and take a look at some of the other social media that can help you tell those stories about your impact in a very human way. Thank you, Perla. Um, and there's a... Uh, a lot to unpack in that story, but one of the things I didn't realize was the connection to Craigslist at its very, at its very origins with the whole finding information to guide our um, actions during Katrina. So, Craig, if you could tell us a little bit about your latest venture, Craig Connects. <laughs> okay. The deal is that over the last decade or so, because of the whole Craigslist thing, I started supporting in uh, usually pretty modest ways uh, a bunch of nonprofits. Usually it has to do with getting the word out, kind of uh, my own uh, half-assed uh, uses of social media, just putting forth one of the few things I've learned from Craigslist, which is to say, start at the grassroots, stay engaged, remain at the grassroots, do what you can to get the word out, and stay with the people. Well, I'm a nerd, uh, you know, plastic pocket protector and all, uh, high school and uh, till now. And that kind of means I remember what it feels like to be left out, to be a disenfranchised. And uh, I keep remembering that. So I just kept reminding myself of that, kept trying to be inclusive, kept, kept trying to include people. So I started supporting nonprofits with this simple kind of lesson, with this early form of social media. And over the last 10 years, I figured, well, I had supported maybe 20 or 30 uh, nonprofits and related organizations. As a nerd, I have different uh, social affect than most, so I kind of regard nonprofits and governmental organizations and others as kind of the same thing. Oh, four or five months ago, I figured, well, I've uh, been supporting these 20 or 30 organizations. I really should get my act together and get organized. So I asked Susan Nesbitt to uh, list these for me worked with her, and what I thought were 20 or 30 organizations <laughs> that I had supported turns out to be about 100. Uh, so I figured, well, I uh, better get that together and give it a name, and that was the uh, birth of uh, Craig Connects, going back several months, but only launching a couple of months ago. So the deal with Craig Connects, it's my own attempt at, uh, well, bearing witness for a lot of the causes that I believe in. Again, the focus is on nonprofits and government organizations which know how to get stuff done. Um, I'm an engineer by training, so that biases me tremendously in terms of you know, organizations and people that are good at uh, getting stuff done. And so st uh, started to uh, list them. So the first thing Craig and X is about is my bearing witness to the groups that I've supported who know and who are effective at getting stuff done. Uh, it'll grow to be about 100 organizations as I get my act better together and list them. But as, I've, uh, as I do this, and as I start to interact more seriously with some of the groups in areas of greatest need, um, what I've started to do with Susan's help and folks like uh, Rad Campaign out of Washington is to try to uh, build into these issues focus campaigns, first with uh, military families and veterans, because I've already been working with the Department of Veterans Affairs a lot, starting to work with groups like Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, the Bob Woodward Foundation, stuff like that. So that's my first area. But also, well, I've realized that on a uh, cultural basis, maybe a civilization-wide basis, we have a problem in the media today where, well, facts uh, don't matter much anymore. News outlets 
now tend to regard fact-checking as a uh, quaint relic of their past. That needs to be reversed. I'm inspired by the most uh, trusted news organization, and as they ironically say, the best darn news organization <laughs> out, that's The Daily Show. <laughs> the deal is that military families and veterans first, but I'm thinking ahead towards things like, how do we get people to care about facts again? The Daily Show uh, gives us one way of uh, making that happen. The deal then is to work with the people I uh, know best in a lot of ways. Because remember, I am a nerd. I don't uh, have the uh, social affect of most. But I can work with my fellow nerds and maybe with the disenfranchised of our time. Uh, some call them uh, little monsters <laughs> and see what happens there and to move all this thing forward. The deal is that in context, you know, I feel that this decade is pivotal in human history. It's the time when everyone gets a chance to use social media to stand up for the stuff they believe in. Mm -hmm. And I feel by the time this decade ends, there'll be a new balance between the disenfranchised, the voiceless of our times, and the people who had money and power all the time. I'm not talking about a revolution. I'm just talking about a balance, again, between the formerly disenfranchised, the formerly voiceless, with the people who've always had uh, power. And so in the long term, that's what Craig Connects is about. So for the now, you know, Craig Connects is about, you know, my personal standing up for stuff I believe in while trying to figure out ways to get real serious about, you know, the people in our uh, culture who don't have a voice and helping out with that. And that's, you know, the next few years or so. But I'm also keeping an eye on this decade. And beyond that, well, I'm thinking about what happens in decades from now through the next uh, couple hundred years. I'm out of my depth here, <laughs> but that's a way of life for me now. That's my lifestyle to permanently be out of my comfort uh, area. And we'll start from there. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Perla. So you both touched on um, some common ideas that I want to just unpack a little bit more so that I can be sure to understand them. Both Craig Connects and great nonprofits are ways of telling stories, it sounds like. But that, how do you, um, make, how do you make sure those stories have the information that others who are reading those stories will need in order to be able to act? on those stories? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's really interesting. Um, so we did a survey of nonprofits who've been getting reviews uh, over the past two years and asking them, so you know, what, how have these reviews impacted your work, impacted your fundraising? And 70% of them said that they share these reviews with their staff. Um, 60% uh, say that they share these reviews with their board. It's very helpful for them to know what's working, what's not, what's being said about them. Um, there was about 14% of nonprofits who've been using it in their fundraising and have been able to raise more money. So one organization is called the Society of Singers, which um, I didn't know this, but uh, when singers go on tour, they have uh, health insurance um, because they're working. But on the day that they finish touring, they no longer have health insurance. Mm. And so this organization is there to provide them with help with medical expenses if they find themselves sick um, and in that situation where they don't have health care. So this organization had all these fantastic reviews by people who said, I was getting through a divorce, I didn't have money to pay my bills, this organization helped me. I had cancer, I didn't have health insurance, this organization helped me. Um, and they were able to raise $45,000 through an email um, where they featured these reviews. And they said that's never have happened before to them. So those are the kinds of stories that we love hearing about because those are, you know, the, those are kind of putting all these stories into action. How do you, how do, you, how do these stories actually affect supporters, how do they affect donors? Um, I can only guess the deal with great nonprofits is that it involves people standing up for the stuff that uh, you guys are doing, which is the uh, hard part. And I can only uh, push people towards great nonprofits as a way of engaging with your community better. Because when someone says something good or bad there, they are uh, indirectly reaching out to you. Mm -hmm. And that's something that can, be, uh, that can be pretty valuable to you. But as I listen to Perla, 
uh, I'm thinking that, well, sometimes we've got to get stories out to people in a somewhat uh, random, or perhaps better said, serendipitous manner. <laughs> the idea is that on uh, your sites, you could have something which does a random pop-up of a story that you reach into great profits, great nonprofits, and get into. Um, maybe that's a pop-up I need for uh, Craig Connects. The deal is that we need some, uh, a little bit of uh, randomness in our lives, mm -hmm. and for people to be standing up for the good work that others do, that ain't bad. There's certainly, uh, you said you weren't fomenting a revolution, but I would uh, posit that there actually is a bit of a revolution underway here in that you're both really creating ways for those of us who interact with nonprofits who may not see ourselves as experts but are passionate about a cause or an organization or an issue mm -hmm. to, to share that story. Okay. Um, and that story upon story upon story actually then becomes a source of expertise. Is there other expertise that people who are looking to solve their um, where do I give, where do I act problem need besides the opinions or in addition to the opinions of volunteers, donors, clients, and supporters? Absolutely. I would say the first, I mean, ideally, you know, you can use websites like mine, look at Craig's recommendations to create a short list of organizations, mm -hmm. and then visit them. Um, you know, what's, what's really interesting, I've visited a, you know, a lot of organizations, and the good ones will invite you to come in pretty much any time they have a program that's appropriate. Come in, walk through, talk to the staff, talk to the clients we serve. They'll probably invite you to like stick around if you want to join the staff for lunch and talk to the staff. And what's interesting also is they might not make a formal pitch to you as a donor because you know, they might say, they, they, most of the good ones, they, for them, they feel like, well, the work is apparent. Here it is. You know, this is what we do. And if you want, if you like what we're doing, uh, you know, support us. That would be great. But if you, you know, don't appreciate what we're doing, you know, we're still going to be here. We're going to still do the work. And I think that's what's really amazing about, you know, probably many of you guys here is that, you know, the work, you know, in many ways, you feel like they speak for itself because you see it every mm -hmm. day. But it's not that apparent to people who are outside of your organization and who may not have the time to do an on-site visit with you. So, you know, kind of communicate more and more about your work because you see it every day and it might seem really mundane to you, but it's really not. I mean, most people in the corporate world are going to an office desktop, you know, pushing advertising, selling shoes, selling cosmetics, <laughs> whatever it is. What you're doing is much more interesting than you actually think it is. Well, the deal is that right now, you know, we do have these social media tools. The ones I use most are Facebook and Twitter. The deal is that you have uh, clients, friends, fans, donors, potential donors. Uh, one thing you uh, may want to be doing is asking them to like your Facebook uh, fan page. And if you don't have one, uh, get one today. <laughs> and then, as they listen, to uh, what you say, ask them to now and then like your posts and to uh, share them. Do the similar stuff too, or encourage them to do the same thing on Twitter, namely do a follow and uh, do a bunch of retweets. I tell people that I retweet partially because it's good to share and uh, partially because uh, retweeting uh, spares me from the burden of original thought, <laughs> uh, but also the hidden agenda is to uh, support, to stand up for the stuff I believe in. Regarding this being revolution versus evolution, the real answer is uh, what a guy said about the, uh, the uh, arc of the moral universe bending towards justice. It's bending uh, more quickly in that direction these days. And when we use Facebook and Twitter in this manner, we're a part of that. You've both told some great stories about individual organizations that have had you know, uh, profound success with one of these tools. I mean, the, that uh, story you told, Perla, must, may possibly be the most uh, return on investment tweet ever sent <laughs> right. in the history of Twitter, which of course isn't a very long history. But um, the, the question I have is, in the aggregate, imagine, put yourself a few years into the future, we're actively using great nonprofits. We're looking for organizations there. We review them. We're connecting with the organizations on Craig Connects. We're adding. We're you know we're creating our own. What's really different about 
the way the nonprofits work? Anything, or is there just a much more vibrant conversation? Or is that conversation going to change the way nonprofits work in some grander scale, do you think? Well, go ahead. Well, it's just that when people engage their communities with anything, that creates a, a feedback loop, which mm -hmm. does change the way that they uh, behave, that they work. Mm -hmm. It's about, I guess, accountability and transparency, mm -hmm. which is something hopefully that'll be uh, uh, demanded as, uh, of us all. Uh, it'll uh, change the way things work, whether you're in a for-profit or a non-profit, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, when you're on the receiving end of that, you're going to have to define what your boundaries and limits are. Um, that's true in government and again, the nonprofits and for profits that we work with start making some decisions about what you can go public on and what you're not going to. Yeah, my hope is that all these next technologies really save nonprofit time and money. You know, I, th I think, you know, we've seen how, you know, so much, so many technologies like our cell phones, like Gmail, have saved us a lot of time and they're just made our lives so much more convenient. And I would love to see that nonprofits can say, you know what, I don't need a full time director of development anymore. Because we've been so successful as, at engaging our supporters, we only need a half time director of development. Or I'm not going to do direct mail anymore. Donors are coming to find me because they realize what an impact my organization is making. Similar to those two independent hotels in Paris, mm. I would love to see the highest performing nonprofits get flooded with donors who want to be involved in their work. And that is sort of the concrete goal is kill direct mail and free <laughs> up the nonprofit ED's time so that you can actually focus more time on programs rather than fundraising constantly. That lesson applies in lots of places. Uh, the deal is that getting the word out on something, on the one hand, is getting cheaper and easier through social media, uh, which is a lot cheaper than, say, a TV. That means, though, you'll be competing uh, more for people's attention. Uh, this is a mixed blessing, but I do perceive it as a, a really good thing when it comes to politics. <laughs> um, you, I'm going to ask you one more question and then open it up for conversation with the room. But um, you touched on the issue of transparency and accountability. How does trust fit into this? How do we know that the, the, the tweet about my cousin's cancer is legitimate or that the reviews on great nonprofits aren't being um, created in-house? How, how, how can I, as an outsider, make sure that I'm getting the right information from these platforms? <laughs> well, you know, one thing that um, Craig really um, inspired and supported us to do was to create these um, charity favorites lists. Yeah. One thing that um, I don't think we do enough is, um, as individuals, even myself, is when we go around, talk about like which charities we stand up for. And Craig has done a remarkable job of that. Um, and so we have a new tool on our site where people can create their favorite charities list and then tweet it out to their friends. Yeah. And so. Definitely over you know, the season of giving, we are um, recruiting more sort of respected and influential people like Craig to create their favorites lists um, and then for them to share it with other people. I mean, how many of us know like who are Arianna Huffington's favorite charities? Like, I don't know. Um, but she would be someone that I respect and I would love to see uh, which charities she would recommend. Um, I would love to see many you know, people who I respect and understand what their, what their charities are and I would love to engage them in conversations about why they support that charity. I mean, I think you know, Alexis de Tocqueville talked about in the 1830s how America was such a vibrant society where all these individuals collectively came together and stepped forward and managed their own affairs through these civic organizations. And, you know, we have 1.4 million public charities now in the United States, and yet I don't know if people are as engaged in charities today as they were when we were a young republic. So not that we need to go back to the 1830s, but how can technology <laughs> bring some of that uh, spirit back, bring some of that, you know, make it easier for us to do that in our busy lives? Um, in the uh, attempt at uh, being clever, I blurted out once that uh, trust is the new black. <laughs> Meaning that uh, the internet hasn't, uh, hasn't changed any of that. By the way, feel free to remind me that I'm not as funny as I think I am. <laughs> um, the uh, girlfriend doesn't hesitate to do that. Um, so, the, so the deal is that right now we have all these user review systems yeah. and they're becoming bigger parts of our lives as they get more organized and on the net. 
the deal is that as bad guys see that, they try to uh, game systems like that, which is something I've spoken about uh, with Perla. Mm -hmm. Because the deal is that uh, in all aspects of our lives, there are people, not a lot, but they're busy, who will try to game systems to favor them. They'll try to run online scams and so on. And this is as true in the nonprofit world as it is in the for-profit world. I just saw an article about that on uh, Care2.com mm -hmm. uh, care uh, this morning. The deal is that we all just have to work together because the greater numbers of us who are doing user reviews and who are trying to stand up for the facts, the more that happens, that solves things. I have also blurted out that the press is the immune system of democracy since they're paid to do this full time, but really we all got to uh, pitch in and try to make that happen. My own part of that is that where I'm working with the Center for Public Integrity to try to figure out how in the press to, uh, again, to make facts uh, matter again, mm -hmm. to reinstitute traditional journalism values about fact-checking, but, uh, but I digress. <laughs> and so I'll just uh, stop there. Well, but there's an interesting um, applicable point, I think, in what both of you are saying, that in fact, part of the trust is in the network. It's in the relationships. It's not a standalone separate thing mm -hmm. that we can count a trusted review. It's how we use the systems. Right. It's what we do with them. So just before we wrap up, any final comments from Craig or Perla about the, all that we've ranged across quite a uh, breadth of topics here, but final thoughts. In any of this stuff, uh, I can only recommend lots of use of social media. It means a change of lifestyle. You're going to be uh, working to some extent at uh, odd hours, weekends <laughs> and stuff, responding to email, Facebook and Twitter. On the other hand, it'll mean you'll uh, have more free time uh, during normal uh, business hours. <laughs> it means you're going to have to uh, be engaged, stay engaged, uh, possibly forever, uh, get ready. And uh, in closing, uh, uh, again, at least to my uh, fellow nerds, uh, live long and prosper. <laughs> but bear in mind that uh, out of there, there may be a lot more of uh, these little monsters than us. <laughs> I just want to congratulate for you guys for coming here today and learning about this, because I'm not worried about you guys. It's the folks who don't attend these events that I'm worried about, like, you know, what, what they're tr doing with their marketing and their fundraising. Um, I think there's so many, so much good that you guys are doing, and you know, I have a lot of stories because these are stories about you guys, and I see a lot of them every day. Um, and they never fail to inspire me, so I would say stay inspired. What you are doing are inspiring. Join me in thanking Perla and Craig.